This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, we turn now to the Dominican Republic, where thousands of people took to the streets of the capital, Santo Domingo, Thursday, to protest the abrupt suspension of local elections earlier this month <laughs> and to commemorate the country's Independence Day. Demonstrators were, wore black and held signs that read democracy and punishment for the corrupt. Massive protests have been ongoing since February 16th, after the government suspended the municipal elections four hours after voting began, alleging there were tech technical glitches in the electronic ballot machines that were used. Reuters reports the machines cost the Dominican government $19 million. But many Dominicans believe the alleged technical glitch is just an attempt by the ruling uh, Dominican Liberation Party, the PLD, to hold on to power as they've lost support. This is one of the protesters in Santo Domingo Thursday. We want to know what happened with the suspension of the municipal elections. We want answers. Young people are 40 percent of voters this year, and we deserve justice, as we have demanded in recent days. Protesters are now demanding an independent investigation in what happened in the local elections, as well as for the resignation of the Dominican Election Board officials. This is Eduardo Fry, president of the Observer Commission with the Organization of American States. The Organization of American States calls on the electoral authorities in the Dominican Republic and the political actors of the country to maintain an honest and constructive dialogue to face the next steps that should be undertaken faced with this complex reality. That was Eduardo Frey. Municipal elections have now been rescheduled for March 15th. Meanwhile, dozens of solidarity protests have sparked. Um, <clears throat> Dominican communities all over the world, from Spain and France to New Jersey, and right here in New York City, where thousands of people demonstrated last weekend in Washington Heights, a predominantly Dominican neighborhood. Nationwide, there are at least 1.87 million Dominicans living in the United States. Some 40 percent of them live here in New York City alone. For more, we're joined by Amanda Alcantara. She is digital media editor at Latino USA and uh, also a Futuro Media. She is a Dominican-American journalist and author of Chula, a bilingual collection of poems and short stories about the life of a Dominican woman before and after moving to the United States. It's great to have you with us, Amanda. If you can start off by talking about what all these protests are about, what happened with the elections in the Dominican Republic? Yeah, so these protests are basically people taking to the streets and saying, you know, our right to democracy and our right to exercise self-determination has been taken away from us. We're talking about a country where people have been disenfranchised in many different ways. We're talking about a, com a country that is predominantly uh, populated by people living in poverty. And this is the one thing that they have to be able to claim, you know, any right to whatever happens to the future of their country. So imagine people standing in line for three to four hours, because that's when the elections were canceled, and being told, you now have to go home because the elections are no longer happening. So people were angry, they were confused, and starting on that very Sunday afternoon, mostly youth started taking to the streets and going directly to La Junta Central Electoral, that's the Central Electoral Board, uh, in Santo Domingo, to protest and to demand answers. And, of course, the, uh, the ruling party in the Dominican Republic has been in power, more or less, for, what, about 20 years now? So, this... over 18 years. So, uh -huh. I like, to, I like to, to talk about sort of like my own age, right? So, I'm 29 years old, and they have been in power almost my entire life, you know? So, like, ever since I've had any sort of political understanding, I've only known the PLD, and that, to me, is, is insane. So let's go to thousands of people um, who are in the streets right here in New York City, in the Dominican community in Washington Heights, to protest the suspension of the municipal elections in the Dominican Republic. This is one of the protesters, Yolis Perez. I'm a professional who had to migrate from my country in search of a better future for my daughter. My daughter's generation needs us to truly wake up and that we clean up our country for them. I mean, um, the 
passion of the people here as passionate of Dominicans here as they are in the Dominican Republic. Talk about the diaspora of the Dominican Republic. And also, can people vote here in the, for the Dominican Republic elections? So, yes, people can vote here for the Dominican Republic elections. Sometimes, uh, you know, there's, there's this sort of nickname that we have specifically for the community in New York, and that's Provincia 33, right? So, sort of like the 33rd province of Dominican Republic. And, you know, I think, even for me being part of the diaspora, we care so much about what's happening in the country, because a lot of the issues that happen in Dominican Republic and a lot of the conditions of the people there actually lead to there being such a widespread diaspora. I mean, we're talking about Dominicans being not only in New York City, not only in different parts of, you know, the United States, but there's a large population of Dominicans in Spain. There's And there's Dominicans all across the globe. And I think these protests are actually have become an opportunity for people to almost come out and say, hey, you know, we're Dominicans and we're also living in the exterior and we would love to live in our country, but it's difficult to live there because of these very issues that are happening. You know, and earlier you asked me about the PLD, right? So people are saying that there was attempts at fraud, you know, so whenever people went to the ballot and they tried to vote for the, their candidate of preference, some of the candidates were not showing up in the ballot. You know, and this is very, very questionable. It's very shady, to say the least. And people see this as an attempt at sabotage. You know, this is the first time in 18 years or the first time at least in a decade when the PLD is no longer ahead in the polls. You know, when instead is the opposition party, which is also questionable, is ahead in the polls, right? So this is the first time when the PLD might not win the elections, you know, and they found themselves in a situation of fear. And instead of, you know, allowing for the democratic process to happen, people see this as an attempt at sabotaging that democratic process. I wanted to ask you about the 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 uh, the attempt to redo the election. Uh, this time, they're going to paper ballots because the problem, apparently, they claim was that this was an electronic voting system that somehow malfunctioned. As if we haven't heard this story before, did we just yeah. hear about Iowa? Did, haven't we heard about all these other problems with electronic voting? Mm -hmm. uh, so now they're going back to the old-fashioned paper ballot, and then they have a presidential election uh, in in May, isn't there? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So these elections were not only, you know meant for people to choose their local leaders. And we know how important it is, you know, to choose the mayor that represents you, to choose the regional leader that represents you. But these ballots were also going to create momentum or were an opportunity to create momentum for the opposition come the presidential elections. Now that momentum has been lost, you know, because there is no credibility in the election process. And we have no idea what's going to happen March 15. Um, also, they spent $19 million on these voting machines. And people are angry about that. A lot of the signs that I have seen in protests, you know, they say these, these dollars, they went to the trash. How can you spend $19 million and all of that and the machines don't work. Like, There's you, been you no can't connection do that. between uh, Dominican Republic and Iowa that's been uncovered, has there? <laughs> Not that we know of, <laughs> but, but I wouldn't be surprised. But also, Amanda, you talk about this, and Juan, you write about this in Harvest of Empire. Talk about the history of the Dominican Republic and U.S. relations there with U.S. soldiers moving into the Dominican Republic, invading the Dominican Republic in 1965, and that how, how that shapes modern-day Dominican Republic. Yeah, so, you know, there were memes propping up during the, uh, on Sunday, of the face of Joaquin Balaguer. And the meme was basically him laughing and saying, wow, you don't even know how to properly steal an election, you know? So Joaquin Balaguer was the man that the United States helped put in power once there was a U.S.-backed coup in 1965. And he was president, you know, I, I like to talk about this a lot because I feel that the Dominican Republic doesn't get, I feel that people normally look at Trujillo right, the Trujillo dictatorship that lasted 30 years, that was like a very, very tough, stronghold regime where a lot of people were killed, a lot of people were disappeared. And they think, okay, after Trujillo happened, we had democracy, that's it. And that wasn't the case. Balaguer was president starting from the 19, like the late 1960s up until the early 1990s. We're talking about like two to three generations of Dominicans who saw Balaguer on and off in power. And his was also a right wing sort of strong regime and a repressive regime. And people are already seeing the connection, you know, between his time in presidency and also how long the PLD has been in power and how they have crushed the opposition. And talking about, you know, U.S. interventions, there was an article in the Washington Post that came out where Giuliani, we're talking about President Donald Trump's attorney, 
was in the Dominican Republic consulting for Luis Abinader, who is the opposition leader. You know, so already the other opposition parties are saying, well, this guy is trying to get U.S. backing, because in the end of the day, it is the U.S. that has a stronghold in the Dominican Republic and foreign American investments that have a stronghold in the country. Final words as we move into March 15th. Um, of course, this is something we will cover, and whether you feel the government will hold fair elections. I think the government has no other choice but to hold fair elections. I think that if they don't, uh, they're, you know, there's, the people will no longer accept, no longer, you know, not having fair elections, right? So I've been thinking about, you know, what does it mean for people to be taking the streets to today, uh, for people to be taking the streets in historic numbers, and whether this can cause change or not, you know? And I don't think that institutional change is going to happen from one day to the next, but I do think that the people now know that these elected officials are accountable to you. You know, so if on March 15, we don't really know what's going to happen, but if the elections are not fair and if they're not transparent, which is what the people are demanding, I think the protests are just going to continue. Well, we'll continue to cover those as well. Amanda Alcantara, uh, digital media editor at Latino USA, Dominican-American journalist, author of Chula, a bilingual collection of poems and short stories about the life of a Dominican woman before and after moving to the United States. When we come back, we look at the fight to save a New Jersey elementary school uh, that serves a large Latino community in New Brunswick, New Jersey, from the forces of a health care industry and gentrification. Stay with us.